Thank you everyone for showing up and welcome to the Austin Club for our one-on-one -on -one conversation with Greg Kassar. Um, it's very exciting to be back in person doing these events. This is not our first in-person event, but it is the first one back at the Austin Club. So we're very excited to have you all with us and uh, be doing these uh, events in person again. So my name is James Barragan. I'm a politics reporter with the Texas Tribune. And thank you to everyone on the live stream for tuning in to our one-on-one -on -one conversation with Greg Kassar. Uh, just as a side note, I, I have known Greg Kassar for a really long time. Uh, I was a younger reporter uh, cover, covering City Hall, and Greg was a younger uh, wannabe politician at that time. Uh, running for the, the newly created city council district. Um, and, uh, and that's how we've met. So we've known each other for several years. Uh, of course, Greg, if you follow um, Austin politics, uh, you, he needs no introduction. He's a Democratic candidate for US House District 35. Uh, he was a member of the Austin City Council from 2015 to 2022. Uh, previously, he was the policy director at the Workers' Defense Project. Uh, the chair of the Austin City Council's Planning and Neighborhood Committee, vice chair of the Public Safety Committee, and a member of the Austin Energy Utility Oversight Committee. Greg, welcome and thanks for being with us. Yeah, thank you guys so much for coming. Thanks to the Tribune and James, good to see you. Yeah, good uh, to see when you. I met you, you weren't a wannabe reporter. You were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I'm excited to, to be back in person with everybody here. And thanks to the Austin Club and all the staff here for helping us out. Great, so uh, let's dive right in. Um, let's start off with uh, your primary election. Um, and, and you know, Lloyd Doggett had represented the district for many years, decided to switch over to a different district, uh, newly created um, to, to represent Austin in different respects. Um, but some big names in, in, in the CD35 primary, you, of course, Eddie Rodriguez, uh, who had represented the area in, in, in the Texas House for nearly 20 years, uh, Rebecca Villagran, former uh, San Antonio City Councilwoman. How, how did you pull off this win in the primary with so many big names in it? What, what was it about your cam campaign? Uh, how were you appealing to voters there? So I'm just so grateful right, for the outpouring of support that we had across four counties, right? All of these districts are so badly gerrymandered and so it's a district that goes over 100 miles from Northeast Travis County all the way down to the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center on the west side of San Antonio throughout downtown San Antonio. And uh, what we decided to do was try to uh, put forward a bold, positive vision for the state and for the district and for the country. Uh, when people think of Texas, a lot of times they think of Greg Abbott or Dan Patrick, but I think of LBJ and Barbara Jordan. And I think talking about that progressive vision for our state really resonated uh, with voters. And so even though it was my name on the ballot, I think that uh, overwhelmingly what won uh, on March 1st was raising the minimum wage and Medicare for all and the right, the constitutional right to abortion care and taking on the climate crisis and union rights. Those things are what people, um, people I think wanted to go and vote for a positive vision when frankly the last two or two and a half years have just felt really hard on people. Uh, and so we went and knocked on people's doors and said, we can do things better. We can make Congress work for us. And, and I think people were really happy about that kind of wherever on the ideological spectrum across the Democratic Party, uh, we had people, you know, coming out just voting to say, yeah, we need to do things better. Yeah, and, and I can attest, I, I actually live in, in the district, uh, and, and I can attest there, there were many Greg Kassar door knockers uh, coming by. But so was that your approach in terms of you're not worried about the other big names in the race, you're not worried about, uh, for example, Rebecca Villagran's appeal in San Antonio or Eddie Rodriguez's appeal in his district here in the Texas House, but it was just about you, the campaign you're running, and the issues. Was that your approach? from the beginning? Yeah, the, the, the goal of the campaign was to say we wanted to be able to win and be the member of Congress, whether you're in Hayes County, whether you are in Comal, whether you're in Bear County, that um, have to be the member of Congress representing the entire district. And not just for District 35, but also for working class politics for our whole state, Latino politics for our whole state. We wanted to, to show people um, that there's something we could be proud of. Um, in this time where really, you know, the biggest headlines are um, are about, you know, our statewide leaders bullying 
you know, vulnerable kids and their families. Being able to come forward to somebody's door and say, we actually are gonna care about you and care, and care about one another. We had people tell, tell me, you know, um, the fact that you, you've had a volunteer come by and then that you sent me a letter, like not just a glossy mailer, but an actual letter, and then you personally came and talked to me. If you're gonna work this hard in Congress, then, then that's really important to me. Yeah. And so that's, that's kind of how we tried yeah. to, to run the campaign because I think that that's what voters have been have been missing um, over the course of so many years here yeah. in Texas. And you were out there door knocking yourself. Um, so even even with all the door knocking, even with all the polls, internal polls that I'm sure you, you, you were running, did you expect to get out of that primary clean or did you expect to go into a runoff? We, our plan was to win without a runoff. Um, I didn't know we'd get four times the votes of everybody else, which was, uh, which to me, um, no, is you know obviously really really an honor and it means that I get to come be here with y'all and start getting to work early but to me it also um, it felt like a real big sense of responsibility when I saw the voting results come in um, you know when I left the city council uh, people joked and we even joked here a little bit earlier like oh man good thing you got got done with that but the fact is that job was like a real honor to be able to um, fight for people in a time of greatest need when we had constituents whose lives were on the line, whose homes were on the line. It's a real responsibility. Um, and as a member of Congress, seeing that that many people said, we're going to give you this shot, to me, um, uh, that was really the overwhelming feeling I had on election night was if this many people think that that, you know, signed up for that promise of we don't want any more GoFundMes to be able to pay for my friend's medical bills, uh, we're sick and tired of attacks on on black lives and on immigrant lives, and we we want to be part of a state that better reflects our values. And if they all went and signed up for that, then that means there's a lot that we've got to deliver. Um, and so it just makes me feel like now I've got to work four times harder if we were given that much of a mandate to go do the work. And you were one of the only uh, big progressive candidates here in Texas. I'm talking about like uh, Jasmine Crockett and Dallas and Jessica Cisneros um, and Laredo. Um, you guys are sort of that little team of progressives. Um, you were the only one that got out clean um, from that primary. Uh, they are obviously in runoffs. Um, so why do you think that is? I mean, is it something about Austin? Is it something about this district? Obviously, Austin is very different from the rest of the state. I think people in Austin sometimes forget about that. Um, so is it something about Austin? Is it something about you? Something about them? Something about their districts? Well, if it had just been Hayes County and Bear County, we would have won without a runoff as well. Um, and so I think that... So it's about you? No. No. <laughs> no, no, because my campaign... Um, we really brought together the full coalition of progressive voices and organizations from across this district. And I'd worked alongside organizations in this district to build that neighborhood infrastructure, that church-based infrastructure, that union-based infrastructure um, that we could then just turn on for this race. I mean, for uh, almost everybody running in these congressional districts, if you weren't planning for years, like plotting maniacally to be a member of Congress, and you didn't know what the districts were until October, right? Right. And so, um, and so we launched the campaign November 4th for a March 1st primary. And I didn't feel unprepared <clears throat> because um, I had been the, the sort of one of the founding members of our uh, statewide coalition of progressive council members and county commissioners. So we had that all plugged in. I had worked on paid sick time campaigns, both in Austin and San Antonio to pass those policies, both those places. So we had connections through labor unions and neighborhood groups in both of those places. When we worked on uh, reducing deportations by Donald Trump, worked really carefully with and alongside people in San Marcos and Hayes County, alongside Austin on some of those immigrant defense policies. And so when it came up, you know, I'd just gotten engaged like two weeks before we decided, you know, I already made you know, a huge life decision that I was really excited about. And then it came up time to run for, for Congress. I didn't feel like on the back foot. Um, we already had all of that organizing done. And so to me, that's why I say Texas, I don't think is a red state. I think it's an underorganized state. And when we do that organizing and show folks that we don't have to just nibble around the edges, we can actually all come together to fight for the things we actually need, um, that people will show up for that. You know, we showed up 
um, for people, and I think people showed up for us at the polls. And so that's why I think the answer isn't just me. I think it is the really hard work we've done up and down the I-35 corridor. What was it about the congressional seat that attracted you to run for it? Because obviously, again, if you've been in Austin politics, you've heard your name being thrown around for like mayor, state senate. Uh, there's been other opportunities, um, and people had always been wondering, like, what what is Greg going to do next? I remember talking to you, and you, you saying you really loved your job. You thought, you know, it was the place where you could best yeah. affect change. Um, but also watching you, I, I know that, you know, you had worked in Hayes County with Mano Amiga and you had worked in, like you just said, uh, in, in San Antonio and other cities for stuff like Page Sick and, and on SB4, you were sort of all over the place. So, so you've been spying on me. Yeah. <laughs> What's <laughs> my job? This is what I do. This is what I do. Um, so what was it about the congressional seat that said, yeah, I'm willing to sort of take that leap and, and try to go for it? I, again, hearken back to folks like LBJ and Bart Burr Jordan because um, we've always needed the federal government to come and intervene um, when we have, frankly, like a right-wing regime in the South or in the state, um, you know, taking advantage of working people. And being able to, to look back at our history and see how civil rights protections usually flowed from the federal government, they were called for by local communities and local leaders. But you needed the federal government to come in with the Voting Rights mm -hmm. Act or the Civil Rights Act yeah. um, or with our current crisis with with health care, you know, Medicaid and Medicare created by the Johnson administration. The next step being getting to an actual single. So was it partly you system. guys getting so beat up here in Austin? That yeah, sort of said, actually, yeah. I mean, to some extent, right. There's only you know, we went and fought for paid sick days policies which have passed the legal litmus test all over the country, even in front of Republican courts. We pass those policies in Dallas, Austin, San Antonio. Baseline, right? This, this is just a, a thing that basically every advanced economy, a thing that people have, that you should be able to take time off work when you're sick, both to take care of yourself and not to get everybody else sick. And in the middle of the pandemic, this all Republican Supreme Court, based on no real precedent that I could see, just blocked it, right? Or when uh, there was this winter storm where literally our neighbors were delivering blankets to other neighbors so that they could survive. Even when they didn't have power at their own house, they said, I have spare blankets. Uh, we're delivering food, trying to keep folks alive. And I get the alert that Governor Abbott is spending his time on Fox News blaming windmills and Senator Cruz is going on, on to the beach. At that point, it's, it's like, we need, we need some help. Um, and I think the best way to do that is for our federal government to pass laws to give everybody the right to a union, for our federal government to electrify our grid and create good climate jobs so that we have a, uh, a planet uh, and jobs in the future, for the federal government to pass voting rights um, and civil rights laws that we need, pass things like the Equality Act so that we can't keep picking on our LGBTQ community or uh, codifying Roe into law. Uh, I think that's what it's probably going to take if we want to take care of our, our community. City council members can do that, but you're fighting with both hands behind your back. I mean, I would usually pa try to pass seven or eight progressive things a year, so that way in the legislative session, they'd try to get rid of one or two of them, or three, you know? <laughs> Bold strategy. <laughs> um, but that, but, that, but that's, what we were in, that's what we were asked to do, right? When you go to a PTA meeting, they, say, they don't say, hey, don't do anything because I don't want to make Dan right. Patrick mad. That's right. not what I'm hearing from parents. Right. They say, I want housing to be more affordable. I want... Uh, you know, the, the lights to stay on. I want my immigrant family members to not um, be targeted and harassed. And so you go and try to do that. And I really admire the local leaders that try to do that uh, and then do a second or third job yeah. that they didn't have to yeah. do of working at the legislature. So, so, so you're not one to play it safe. But uh, that being said, I mean, the effect has also been that there has been backlash from the state. So looking back at your time on city council, I mean, do you have any regrets or you wish anything had gone differently from the way that that it played out? Oh, well, I mean, I'm a perfectionist, so of course, with 2020 <laughs> hindsight, I always think about what I um, could have done better, what I uh, should have learned from. Uh, I think that um, part of what we, what I learned from, for example, the battle over homelessness, was to really start working closely with the community to make sure that our community really um, is ready for the backlash. And I think that's part of why we were so successful at beating back the Republican-led and police association-led Proposition A, which would have just devastated the city's budget and poured it all into uh, mass incarceration and policing, which we you know, won that referendum election by a huge margin. 
And what that took was when we made transformations to our police budget, which were absolutely, in my view, the right thing to do. We'd actually already been working with the community for a really long, for a while building up to that to say, hey, there's gonna be back, there's gonna be backlash. And frankly, if we didn't change the police budget, they are probably gonna run some bills on that anyway. And so let's be ready um, and let's be organized. And that's why medics and firefighters and mental health professionals and business leaders and public sector um, professionals all came together and said, we're gonna, th these, these changes to the police budget are the right thing to do, no matter how much noise we hear from folks like Governor Abbott about it. And so I think I learned from some of those prior fights to be, um, to be more strategic and be more ready for, for what they were gonna throw our way. Yeah, uh, on homelessness, uh, I remember running into you on the street. Uh, the Did week I look before, tired? Before you announced it and you said, I'm about to get into the biggest, biggest fight of my career. Uh, referring to the homelessness ban, and I, I think that turned out to be to be true. Um, let me push back a little on that because I mean the the ban was reimposed, um, and so even though maybe you had the support of some people in the beginning, I think perhaps it didn't turn turn out that way. I think I think right. the public opinion shifted on that. And oh yeah, so no, for what, sure. I I would say that's why I meant that I think I learned some things yeah. uh, from that for when we went and took on issues of policing, on on the issue of homelessness. A virtually impossible issue. I think a really divided community sentiment on what you do when you don't have enough housing. And right. that's why I think you have city leaders, like I said, fighting with both hands behind their back because when you don't have enough housing, I think the community really divided on, well, then what do you do? Right. Do you just leave folks alone or do you move folks from one bridge to another, or put folks in jail for a night and then have them back at the bridge? Nobody has the answer to yeah. that. I talked to thousands of people and everybody says, well, that one's hard. Yeah, but the, what would, would you would you do it again? Like given what you know now, I think the answer to that will be, we finally set aside the funding and the services as a city uh, to actually house thousands of folks experiencing homelessness and drastically reduce homelessness in the city. If that plan goes gets put into effect and properly implemented, and several years from now. Uh, we have drastically fewer people living on our bridges and drastically fewer people dying on our streets, then it was absolutely worth it. If um, that plan, if that momentum doesn't actually fully get realized, then, then, then I think we missed a huge opportunity and we should be ashamed because what it caused was sure some political difficulty for me and for my friend the mayor and you know we all talked about it and, and, and felt consternation, but the real difficulty is, you know, Folks feeling like, hey, I can't use my park and I want these folks to be able to have a place to live or people dying on the street. Right. And if that gets fixed because we went through all this, then it was totally worth it. Right. That's that's what I was going to get at because it was consternation for the people of Austin, too. I mean, I remember going into yeah, a hard the voting booth and 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 I think the statesman wrote it this way. that They didn't even endorse in that in that special election because they said we're not going to tell people between two bad choices. But that's I guess right. what I'm hearing you say is not that. 100% you would do it again, but now that they have the funding, that's the way to go. But it would have never happened without that. Without the funding. No. Right. I mean, ask anybody. There's no right. way it would have yeah. happened The number that. one solution to homelessness is to find those people houses, to find those yeah, people homes. exactly. Right. And we weren't doing that. So in my first two years on council, we approved, I think, somewhere around not 50 or so permanent supportive housing units. Right. That is the housing that has the services necessary to end someone's homelessness. It's not just a shelter bed you come back and forth from, but you're still Right, home. they have medical services, all the wraparound services they need. So it was somewhere around 50. It was definitely under 100. Yeah. I can pull you the, the yeah. exact I remember, number. I covered it in It was very little yes. <laughs> in those first couple of years. Um, and really part of why I ran for council was that I wanted us to stop being a faux aggressive city and start being a progressive city that actually lived up to the values that we abide by, or that we say that we abide by. And what, in the last two years on council, we approved close to 1,000 homes with services for folks experiencing homelessness. I mean, that is a transformational shift. And if all of those get built and we stay committed to that path, which is supported by our faith leaders, and we got some folks here from the faith community, was supported by working folks, by neighborhoods, then whether your issue is a humanitarian issue that you really want to just see your fellow folks in the city helped, or whether you just have the consternation of our public spaces need to be um, you know, used by everybody in the public and not just a place where folks have to sleep because they have no other choice, then I think all of those constituencies will look back and say, I'm, even though we went through that hard time as a community and wrestled with that, 
if they got fixed and some politicians got bruised in the process, that's democracy at its best. I mean, that's not us just arguing with each other and nothing ever gets fixed. That's not a continued endless, you know, uh, beating up on the on the vulnerable or distracting people with you know political stunts. That would be us as a polity, you know, having a really hard discussion, having a hard time, and then at the end of the day, doing something really important that almost no other city has ever been able to do. And that's what we're supposed to do. If they get built, if they if they follow. Yeah, the and plan. right now the trend is good. Okay. Uh, but it doesn't get fixed. I mean, if this got fi could get fixed in a year, then right. I wouldn't have had this problem. This yeah, listen, I, I, I've been covering homelessness in, in Austin for a long time. I, 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 uh, I'm old enough to remember when Mayor Adler declared that homeless veteran, veteran, veteran homelessness was over here in like 2015, 2016. So it's a hard problem. I understand it. Um, and I learned a new word, faux aggressive. So thank you. <laughs> the other thing that you're talking about in terms of the homelessness issue is uh, also um, affordable housing. And I remember uh, from your early days in council, you were like a real nerd for that. I remember running into you at you know uh, events and you talking about the missing middle. Uh -huh. um, so talk a little bit about that and what has the city done? What have been your efforts? What do you think still needs to get done? What can you do from, if, if you go to Congress, what can you do there? Yeah, it's one of the biggest crises we have in the city by far. Right. I mean, if we thought that we were getting too expensive in 2015 when I got elected, I mean, look at home prices right. today. And, you have, and Google and Facebook and Apple are not going to stop coming. Right. And so there is so much. This is where the city is fighting with just one hand behind their back, because there is a lot our city can do. Yep. They need a lot more federal help. We need to change uh, in some ways what we're facing and you're seeing in Austin is a yep. reflection of how broken our national economy is where it's a winner takes all economy and you're seeing more and more inequality. So you're gonna see more and more inequality in housing prices because you've got some folks making a lot of money who can offer twice as much on that house and folks right. that whose uh, wages are not keeping up with inflation. Um, so we have to sort of fix and work on national inequality, um, but our city has so much more it can be doing. Right now, our rules and regulations basically say we're either gonna uh, incentivize replacing a little apartment complex with a giant one or a little house with one big house. And there is um, many more of our affordable cities have things like row houses, have things like the fourplex where you can buy one fourth of it and you're sharing the land cost. Uh, and that is something that I think progressives are starting to unify around. This is a thing that both you know, me and Senator Warren were talking about when she was here uh, and me and Representative Ocasio-Cortez's staff were talking about when we were hanging out at the Mohawk on Red River, um, that we both need massive federal investment in housing. Um, we need more efficient um, housing. And then we also need sort of to take a look at some of these rules and regulations that are really built for the suburbs um, that, are, that still exist here in Austin. So uh, Senator Warren actually has some legislation to say we need to incentivize um, getting rid of some of these exclusionary rules um, around some of our big federal transit investments. And so uh, I'd really be you know, a supporter of pushing cities on that issue. Has the city done enough in terms of providing that affordable housing? We talk about these big developments. They're talking about it now with the, with the statesman development. You know, they, they provide these units that are so small that only one person can live there, and then they call it an affordable unit. But I mean, the people who need this are like working class families, you know, lower working class families. And so has, has the city done enough to push back on developers who are, I mean, to be frank, creating like these wonderfully M massively expensive development for the uh, more higher income people. And then I, I know the city's stated yeah, goal yeah, is to have right. affordable housing, but- have, The city has really limited tools. And so uh, we have a ban on inclusionary zoning in the city, which would be a sort of more fair way to require certain levels of affordability from everyone. What you have right now in Texas is just a negotiation or incentive system. Right. And so you sit on the city council and you try to squeeze out everything, every drop that you can get. Give me a little thing for a nonprofit. Give me a little. Um, but at the end of the day, you can't really see how much profit they're making on the back end. You don't know um, when you're when you um, you know when to call each other's bluff and not. Um, and so it's re it's a really tough system. And so if the if the state government would just allow um, a more uniform system, it would be much better. Same thing with the with the state. Right now, you can't have progressive taxation. Uh, where you'd say, look, if you've got a development that is making, uh, that is really, really luxury, you're going to pay a higher tax rate than 
you know, grandma who bought her house forever ago and is having trouble staying in her house. Um, and so again, I have my sympathy on the other hand, um, to this progressive progressive point, when I came on to council, affordable housing was one of the only issues that was losing at the ballot. Parks was passing on the ballot, uh, drainage infrastructure was passing on the ballot, transportation and public safety, but affordable housing had failed. And part of, I think, what it really is transforming here within our city is to say affordable housing has to be the number one priority. Uh, and by packaging things like affordable housing into the subway and light rail uh, project that passed in 2020, that actually helped it pass. So I think we're starting to see a transformation of our city's politics to say the city should own more land, then the city is really in the driver's seat. Uh, so one example is the Home Depot at St. John's and I-35. Uh, the city had previously planned to make that a courthouse and criminal justice center with a police station. When I talked to neighbors in that historically black neighborhood, overwhelmingly now an immigrant neighborhood, nobody said that that's what they wanted there. Um, what they wanted was a place where the kids could play uh, and affordable housing. And so because the city owns that piece of property, we were able to set and say half of these units should be affordable and affordable for the folks that currently live in this neighborhood and actually affordable enough to bring people back to St. John that have been pushed out. Uh, and so I think that our city leaders um, need, need to keep affordable housing at the very forefront, but they need federal help. Um, and I think that will require yeah. things like federal investment. To Only they land. had someone who knew these issues in, in, in Congress. Yeah, and then, and, and then find some way around the filibuster, too. Okay. Great, great pitch, Greg. Yeah. Great pitch. Um, defund the police. We talked about it a little bit. Um, and I know your communications guru is here in the audience. She probably can't save you from yourself sometimes. Uh, but ha ha talk a little bit more about sort of what you've learned from, from that battle in terms of you're, you're going potentially to a bigger stage where defund the police is, is going to be an even bigger issue. And, and if you get there, Fox News will be all over. I'm sure they were all over this one, but in, in a much more watched way. So what are some of the lessons in terms of how you will communicate um, that you're taking uh, as you potentially go up to Congress? I mean, like, I, I don't know. I mean, do, do, would you still keep using the term defund the police or would you like to do something different? Because it's easy, it's easy to, to attack it that way. Right. Well, I mean, one thing is, you know, that's never a term that I, that I use because, or used because the policy that I brought forward was really trying to shift public funding away from just over-militarized policing, policing that we knew um, and an academy that we knew had a problem here in Austin towards other things like mental health first response and domestic violence shelters. That's what we did. Um, and I think that uh, this kind of obsession sometimes uh, within the Democratic Party of us uh, trying to blame uh, activist movements for our, for our challenges as Democratic politicians isn't the way to go. Um, I appreciate and think it's good. Uh, it's an amazing thing for activists to stand up and ask for a change. Um, and, and I'm supportive of that. And I don't think, uh, so I, I guess I'm challenging your framing here. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, I don't- I'm confident in my framing. <laughs> yeah, good, I'm glad. Me too. Um, uh, you know, MLK was not popular when he did his yeah, activist people forget. work. Yeah. Um, and his goal was not to get more Democrats elected. His goal was to transform American society both short term and long term. And he absolutely did that. Colin Kaepernick, when he kneeled, you know, the Gallup poll showed him overwhelmingly unpopular, but a really important thing for him to have done. Same thing, really important for the biggest uh, protest movement, probably in American history, um, or at least the biggest one in my lifetime since the civil rights movement, to stand up and say we need change to have a more just society, um, especially for black folks and folks of color. And it's not, their job in the streets um, to come up with exactly the right slogans to, to, to help us get elected. Right. That's not their job. Right. What, so what I learned in that moment was to try to be on the right side of history, try to do the right thing, but to do my job. And my job was to figure out from a policy level what things we could do to make things better. And I think we did, and I think the voters then came back and said, we're good with that. Where we said, we're gonna take a pause on our police academy, we're gonna come back and hire more police officers, but first we're gonna make sure they're trained right to the standards that 
uh, that our community expects after yeah. we had multiple reports saying the training was awful. Yeah. So not more or less policing, but just better policing. We needed to do it better. And in some cases, um, to have something better than policing respond to a 911 call. So Austin is the only big city in the country where if you call 911 right now, and don't unless there's an emergency, but if you call 911, they say, do you need fire, police, EMS, or mental health? That was only possible because um, we had a lot of folks marching asking for us to try to do things better. I had been working on that for years with folks like Councilmember Kitchen since um, um, David Joseph, a naked teenager in mental health crisis, was needlessly killed here. We'd been working on that for years, couldn't get it funded. Um, and this was an opportunity to say that same police officer, that same funding that sends someone to that mental health call, let's send someone that's going to make it safer for the person in mental health crisis and make it safer for the first responder. Right. And that's what we did. And that's what I've been trying to talk about having done. And I think that's uh, what police ask for too, right? They, they don't want to be responding to every single thing. They, like if it's a if it's a medical situation, there, there are lots of folks. Health. There are lots of folks um, uh, that I've talked to that have walked the beat that say that makes sense. Of course, then it gets politicized, and of course, Fox News and the governor. I mean, the governor woke up here in Austin and went to Fort Worth and had a press conference about Austin from over there, um, and um, and of course that happens. But I think it's really important for us um, as progressive Democrats to 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 do our best to have our messaging machine talk about what it is we're trying to do, the fact that these are actually pretty, as you said, reasonable and thoughtful proposals in response to a community movement, um, and that in fact it's really the Republican agenda that has gotten so radical on so many issues. But it is interesting uh, and unfortunate, right, that some of these things get painted as a, as a radical idea when I'm just saying, hey, look, we haven't had a family violence shelter funded by the city in over a decade, let's do that. We need mental health first responders. We need an ambulance to take care of folks in COVID. It's sort of a messaging war though, right? Because it's very easy for Republicans to attack you and say, well, you're just defunding the police. Then you have to sort of react and say, well, actually that's not what I'm doing, doing these things. Yeah, telling the truth and trying to do the right thing makes it harder to be a Democrat. <laughs> Let's look forward to Congress. Uh, if you end up going, it's going to be a much bigger place. Uh, we were reminiscing earlier about the switch to a 10-1 system here in Austin. Uh, so, so you only have to convince 10 other people um, on council. There you'll have to convince 434 in your chamber and then 100 in the other one. Um, so how do you plan to be effective? And you've answered my question about what kind of congressman will you be, which is a progressive, not a faux aggressive. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, I'm glad you like the term, man. I'm going to use that more now. Um, so. We've seen how the new young progressive members of Congress have really shaped the conversation. Um, I would have before hesitated about a congressional run, but now that you see folks like, you know, Cori Bush, uh, in her freshman term as a member of Congress, went and slept, did a sleep in on the Capitol steps, and managed to create the space for the president to extend the eviction moratorium and kept thousands of Americans in their homes during the pandemic, when they otherwise would have lost their homes. She didn't have to negotiate with. Mitch McConnell or Joe Manchin, uh, she was able to get something done and didn't wait her didn't wait her term, uh, or didn't just wait her quote unquote turn. Uh, and I think that that is a really good thing for our democracy. You know, when we talk to <clears throat> voters, they don't say, "Hey, I want Congress to go slower. I want you to go and wait as long as possible before you do anything." Uh, and I think that the new young members are starting to, to show that we can do that differently. So I want to be able to do that kind of work. And that if there were just a dozen or two dozen more people doing that, I think it would change the entire institution. But then I also, I think progressives are doing a much better job um, legislating. You know, Pramila Jayapal at the head of the Progressive Caucus, I think has really um, shown how if you build a real progressive block, um, then you win things like the earned income uh, tax credit for kids. Um, you're able to, to, it looks like, hopefully start moving folks like Joe Manchin on a, on a climate agenda, and I hope that they're able to get some of that done this year. And so, uh, but my job on council was to try to do both, and I'm going to keep trying to do both, of trying to, to hold a set of progressive votes to make sure that our legislation is less corporate and less inequitable and more for working people, um, and then also use my immediate voice. Yeah, so you'll hit the ground running on progressive issues, it sounds like. What do, you, what do you say to more moderate Democrats? I mean, like, 
uh, Abigail Spanberger, for example, who said, like, you guys are making, like, stop saying defund the police. You're making our jobs more difficult. I mean, what do you say to, and not just specifically her, but I mean, there's a lot of Democrats who feel that way, right? Yeah, and, and I recognize that there are going to be people in swing districts. And um, my job, part of what I worked on as a council member was if somebody was in a swing district uh, as a state rep, I've gone and knocked doors, right? Frank Ramirez, who is in probably the, the swingiest district now under the new districts. I was working uh, to try to help him here in the special election. I'll be helping him in November. Uh, and Frank and I aren't gonna have the same policy positions because I'm gonna reflect my district and he will reflect his. And I think we can have uh, that kind, we can be that kind of broad tense party. I mean, I plan on raising money for uh, Democrats this year in swing districts uh, who may not have as progressive a policy positions as me, but I know that if I want to pass progressive policy, then we need a Democratic majority in the Congress. And so, so I guess what I'd say is I'm here and ready to help. Um, and, and I think that we need more of that. And I think we need more of that both directions. But the one other thing, though, is that regardless of how, quote unquote, moderate or progressive your district may be, I think that Democrats need to show up for working class issues and working families because I think that works in Republican, modern, independent, and heavily Democratic and progressive districts. And right now, there's such an opportunity for that, especially in a place like Texas. I mean, we heard this constantly at the door, that right now, uh, the, the Texas Republican agenda is to regulate mother's wombs, and the progressive agenda needs to be to raise workers' wages. Uh, and I think that that um, is a message that we should be having in every single, in every single district, um, whether you are in um, Ms. Spanberger's district or mine or Colin Allred's or Veronica Escobar's or trying to, to flip a seat. Uh, I think that we need to be standing up for unions, for raising wages, for tackling inequality and against uh, just the amount of corporate profit that there's been during the pandemic. So more of that going to working people, I think that's going to work across the country. Yeah, I think when, when you talk about it like that, I think Democrat, when you talk about the issues, uh, just like you just did, you know, unions and working class people. I think Democrats can get on board with that. I think maybe it's it's the tone that's a little different. I think that's something that I've definitely noticed as a reporter. The tone is different with you and with folks like Jasmine Crockett and Jessica Cisneros, a little bit more fiery, a little <laughs> bit more willing to push the envelope. Um, but they are also pushing very progressive policies um, that, you know, really ring in urban areas um, and sort of make people uncomfortable in other areas, even Democrats. So is there a risk that with this new sort of progressive uh, slate of folks running for Congress, um, if you all three of you end up winning, um, it, it increases the perception of the Democratic Party as a party that's just for urban people of color and makes it more difficult to win statewide? Yeah, so a few things there. Because um, you say it increases the perception, right? And there's no, you don't have a subject to the verb, yeah. right? Who's increasing that perception? Oh, we've got an editor now here. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, yeah, man. Yeah. Well, um, you know, who's increasing the perception, right? Uh, I mean, the way that I just explained to you mental health funding or the fact that people shouldn't have to, um, you know, pawn, their, pawn off their belongings to pay for life-saving medical care or get a GoFundMe campaign. Um, or the focus on workers and unions. That's been what I've fought for and what many, many progressives in this town and across the state have fought for pretty consistently. Um, and I try to use the same tone pretty much everywhere. Uh, and that perception gets created because there is a huge, extremely well-funded propaganda machine um, on the right that consistently hits the same message while um, we uh, have these difficult conversations about, oh, well, what is it that we need to do better? And part of what we have to do better is go and connect with communities and make sure that they know what it is that we're fighting for, what our tone actually is, um, instead of uh, just sort of letting the right define us. So no, I actually think that if you've got young, hardworking progressives that are willing to knock those doors, um, are willing to be out there in front of the community, to show folks that we're going to have workers' backs and not big corporate, not big corporations' backs, that's actually exactly what it is that we need. Um, uh, because if, I mean, we didn't just win my primary just with progressive Democrats. I mean, we won with older Democrats, younger Democrats, Democrats of color, white Democrats, uh, across the ideological spectrum, uh, with that 
positive vision. And I think folks just need to be able to have that, that option. I don't think we're going to win Texas with, um, with, you know, a, a weak promise that maybe will make things less bad. I think that we're going to win Texas by telling folks that we're going to have their backs and that they're going to do better um, in a big way. People aren't sending us to Congress to say, hey, I want you to make my life about the same. People are sending us to Congress to say, we want to see big, big change in Texas. Let me ask you about uh, leadership in, in the House. Um, if, if, if nothing major changes, it does look like the Democrats are probably going to lose the House. But let's just imagine for a second that something crazy happens and Democrats keep the House. Um, speaker Pelosi had sort of term limited herself. She'd made the promise that she wouldn't run for speaker again. Um, and she's running for reelection, but she hasn't said if she would run for speaker again. Um, in the event that Democrats kept the House, or let's say it's 2024 and you're there and uh, she wants to run for speaker again, I mean, would you support Pelosi or are you looking for new leadership in the House? You know, I've got a chance to meet with Speaker Pelosi uh, a couple, you know, both at an event and then at a smaller thing here recently. Uh, and I think that she really wants to, to fight for those uh, big issues. And uh, we, you know, we'd have, the, have a conversation amongst the Progressive Caucus about that speaker about that speaker uh, race, but I'd be, you know, uh, I think that she has done really, really hard work. And I, I think that if that she wants to keep being Speaker of the House, she's probably gonna keep being Speaker of the House. Yeah. And I think my job would be both to support her in that, but to support the most progressive version of that leadership um, that we can get. Uh, you know, most likely um, you're gonna have a speaker's race in the future. And then I think, you know, they, then we'll have that conversation. Yeah. Uh, but if she were to run, and, and you were in the majority. You would be. Yeah, I don't. To support my, yeah, my my sense is that is not um, is that the, the, our barriers to progress are not Speaker Pelosi. And, you know, she's definitely one of the more progressive members of the House and one of the more progressive speakers we've had. I just think that she has to manage a really big uh, a really big caucus. And what we need is a caucus that is really organized on the progressive side, so that Speaker Pelosi can bring uh, the most progressive version of the caucus into leadership. Um, and so that, that's, that's my take. But no, I've never, I mean, you know, again, contrary to maybe what people, um, to what people uh, portray me and lots of folks in Austin as, I've always been, you know, a proud member of the Democratic Party, uh, just of the progressive wing. You know, I, didn't, I haven't been running against the Texas Democratic Party or against Speaker Pelosi in any um, of, the, of the campaign because Again, I think that falls into the same Republican traps. Uh, what, I, what we're running on is on those issues, and I think that that's what working Texans want to see, is us be able to fight for those issues and then point out who is in the way of, of passing that progressive policy. Okay, um, got a... We get into page three. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we are going to start uh, taking questions uh, from the audience in a bit. Um, uh, before we open the mics for questioning uh, from our in-person audience, thank you to Texas Tribune members who joined us virtually and in person today. Your support really makes all of this possible. Uh, if you're not a member and you value our events, uh, donate using the QR code on the back of your printed programs that you all have at your tables. Um, and you may also donate and join as a member at texastribune.org slash give. Um, feel free if you have a question to come up to the mic or if you want to just raise your hand. We've got a question that was submitted ahead of time uh, by a Texas Tribune reader. And Glenda asks, whoever wins this seat in November will be responsible for a large area of San Antonio. As someone who has always been focused on Austin, how do you plan to reach out to San Antonians and make sure they are included as much as your home turf? Yeah. I am um, tasked with being as much the San Antonio member of Congress as Austin. Uh, so I'm splitting my time pretty equally between the, the two. Actually, today is uh, yesterday and today were like my first full days back. I've spent a bunch of time in San Antonio here the last two weeks. Uh, and I'm going to have, um, you know, if we win, but this is, of course, built to be a Democratic district, you know, have. Uh, just like we had in the campaign, a San Antonio office and an Austin office. In the campaign, we off opened our Austin and San Antonio offices at the same time, going to be working to do the exact same thing as a member of Congress. And I think that um, the state has a lot to learn from San Antonio. I mean, San Antonio has managed to preserve a lot of that 
uh, affordability. San Antonio has deep roots in the progressive movement. You know, if you think of Emma Tenayuca and the Pecan Shellers Union, you know, one of the most important Latino and Latina-led organizations in the history of the state uh, drove a lot of our progressive politics. So I'm really excited to yeah. be able to represent San Antonio. And so who, whose tacos are better, San, San Antonio or Taco? You know, hey, I'm gonna steal the line from you, which is that tacos are something that should bring us together, <laughs> not tear us apart, man. There we go. Okay. Uh, we got a question? Yes, uh, thank you for being here, uh, Greg. Uh, my name is Dale Bula, and I didn't hear much talk about immigration uh, today, which is a big national issue. Um, when we talk about Ukraine and the massive influx of refugees, uh, what isn't really being considered is when the sea level begins to rise and the east and west coasts of North and South America are underwater, uh, we haven't even begun to see the massive influx of refugees. Uh, climate change is uh, causing people in South America to starve because the, their crops won't grow. And so this, uh, these climate refugees are not even being discussed. Uh, hopefully that'll be part of your agenda. Thank you. Ta ta you want me to touch base a little bit on climate? Yeah, if you want to touch base, and I do have a, a question just about where you are on Title 42 and what we should be doing on the board. You want me to hit all three of those? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, the climate crisis uh, is the most, the biggest existential crisis humanity faces. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, as progressives in Texas, we have such an important opportunity and responsibility to lead on that issue. Uh, and in, I think with the winter storm and people losing power and water for days in some constituents, even for weeks, uh, it's finally really, it's real for people. And so driving a climate jobs agenda, I think is so important for that. I think um, creating, addressing issues of inequality are critical for us to be able to yeah. push back on. I think so much of the ability of people to fear monger about immigrants and refugees is uh, based on tapping into folks being stuck economically. And if people can see that, look, we're fighting for them and they're, we're fighting for working class people's economics, whether they got here yesterday or whether their family's been here for 10 generations, um, I think is going to be critical for, for us. And so addressing the climate crisis, uh, addressing inequality and immigration in tandem, um, incredibly important priorities. And I think that we can be uh, leaders on climate in the state. You know, uh, the moonshot, uh, you know, JFK and folks investing in things like NASA here in Texas getting to the moon. We have to, our moonshot now in Texas is for us to uh, create, you know, millions of climate jobs and to address the climate crisis. And I think if we're doing that well, and we're showing people that there's a path to a stable middle-class union job while we tackle the climate crisis, then I think it will create more space um, for those of us that care about immigrant rights to have victories there as well. Sounds good, thank oh, you. Oh, and then Title 42. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Title 42 is a Trump era policy that is meant to keep folks out based on the, the sort of lie that had something to do with COVID. And so, uh, so I really, you know, I support the Biden administration getting rid of, of Title 42. And, uh, and I think that, again, as Democrats, it's really important for us to stand with our values. And, and I think that um, instead of uh, seeming like we're torn on it, just standing up for immigrants' rights as a basic human right um, is something that I think a lot of voters would respect. What else should the Biden administration be doing in terms of uh, the, the number of migrants at, at our border? Yeah, I think also, though, hearing uh, officials and communities along the border and in South Texas about the need for investment in those communities, really important investment in ports of entry, but also in those neighborhoods, being able to help them deal with a crisis that um, is hitting lots of countries to the south of us, and them having to, to be the entry point for that isn't an easy thing. So I hear that. Um, but our entire country benefits from immigration, we all are, are better off for it. And so I think our entire country should be investing in places like the RGV and along the border, all the way over to El Paso to make sure that they're not having to, to, to handle it alone. Right, but border officials are, are overwhelmed. So, I mean, is there anything that the federal government should be doing to help like yeah. the, the people who are dealing with them? Yeah, migrants? exactly. That's what I'm saying. We need to help the folks that are dealing with I mean, right, you do have large migration because you've had a huge public health and economic disruption, plus um, all the political issues happening in the Northern Triangle. But the 
I think investment for those officials, critical, and Inv investment for those counties and cities and towns, huge. But um, you can do that while living up to our values and not having this, this sham rule. So do both. Yeah. Okay. Question? Sure, thanks. Uh, Jeffrey Jacoby, Texas Campaign for the Environment. Good to see you again, and I'm really excited for you to uh, represent me and my neighbors in Congress. Um, I actually saw you at the Mohawk, uh, by the way. I didn't see AOC, though. Humble so you, brag, huh? Yeah, you, you got to <laughs> let me know the next time that she's in town. Um, my question for you is, you know that Texas is under assault from the fossil fuel industry. But these companies are proposing these faux climate solutions uh, like carbon capture and hydrogen, and they're wrapping it in this green gauze and the Biden administration is buying it. And there's the real distinct possibility that this administration is going to invest billions of infrastructure dollars in fossil fuel projects proposed by the Exxon Mobiles of the world. So what will you do as a progressive member of Congress to stand up to the administration to resist that investment? And as a follow up, are you willing even though you represent Central Texas, to visit these Gulf Coast communities that are in the shadow of this, uh, of this proposed assault on our coast and on our state. Thanks. Thank you for your question. Um, and so, the, um, so I think that, again, a really critical role for members of Congress is being able to use our bully pulpit. You know, you're just one of 435 over there, but you're one of just a few um, either at home and in the state. And so I think that both being able to stand up to bad projects and then, and then push for that money to go to good ones that we can then herald for the administration is something I'm really interested in doing. You also have great reps out in places like the Houston area, like uh, uh, Congresswoman Silvia Garcia, um, who uh, is a progressive member, who I think we should listen to, rep has represented since she was a county commissioner, a lot of those places where people rely on those fossil fuel jobs and I think it's not just am I willing to go there, but I think we have to be able to work together to hear out what those constituents who rely on fossil fuel jobs need and what our entire sort of planet and country needs to come to, to a fix. And that fix, it's not going to be worth it. Um, it's not worth it for either any party for it to be something that actually doesn't fix the problem, but just sounds like it does. Then that's even worse, right? That's worse than nothing at all. And so I think really important for us to show how real electrification uh, can create good union jobs. And so that's partnership both with, um, both with companies, with the labor movement, with the administration, and then with the members of Congress that represent those areas. So thanks so much. I hear there's a guy who's interested in electrification here in Austin. Uh, good morning, folks. My name is Ross Smith. Uh, I have a follow-up question on transportation. There's gonna be billions of dollars flowing down into Texas and into this district. Uh, we have a long history uh, nationwide of whenever that happens, neighborhoods, uh, poor neighborhoods, minority neighborhoods getting bulldozed to make room for asphalt. Um, how do we avoid, what are your thoughts on how to avoid that happening this time? That's a great question. Thank you so much. Uh, part of it will be working really hard with uh, tra Transportation Secretary Buttigieg. Uh, on those issues. You know, we've seen how successful advocacy in Houston um, has, has temporarily stopped the, I the really needless I-45 expansion into black and brown neighborhoods there. Uh, and something that's also really important for us to be talking about is making sure that as we move big investments, that we direct more of it towards cities and counties instead of, uh, instead of states, because so often, you know, that might work in some places, but here in Texas, we've seen how when things like big uh, COVID relief dollars got moved to Governor Abbott's office uh, in the cities, we were begging for that help. We were begging for small businesses to get saved. We were begging for, for people to not have to lose their homes, and that money was, was really held up. And so as a member of the House, I think there needs to be increased push from city council members, uh, former city council members, former mayors and county commissioners to direct more money to cities because I think they're gonna be more responsive to their neighbors and neighborhoods. And then also to really push for that money to go to things like transit projects instead of big highway expansion because we've seen how big highway expansion actually doesn't solve traffic and then really hits those, those neighborhoods. The local officials strike back. I like it. It's That's right, man. 
Hey, so I heard you talking about immigration and families coming um, both from Ukraine, South America, and from Mexico. What is your plan on supporting students as they also enter our system and these families come over? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, we need, um, you know, real, and I mean, public ed in this state has fallen so far behind uh, just in our lifetimes, right? We did not used to be ranked so close to the bottom. And I think that that's a, a big thing that we need to be pushing on uh, our legislature about is to actually take some of the prosperity that's coming into the state and directing it to our kids and into and into young people. Um, I think also something that the federal government is able to do, and I'm a big proponent of, is free public college, uh, trade school, and community college, free public universities, uh, because that's a big that's a big area where the Biden administration can make a huge difference. Again, not a radical proposal, something you have in most advanced economies. And if we show that we're talking about improving your kids' schools, we're canceling your student debt, we're out there to raise your wages, then Governor Abbott looks like more of a fraud, right? What he's spending his time doing is like holding truckers up at the border. And I think you were there reporting on that uh, recently, right? What they're spending their time doing is bullying our kids. We need to be able to show that we're actually out there investing in those, in those schools and in those families. And then hopefully, um, I really, really hope the president cancels at least some portion of student debt this year. And we've got time for one more question. So you guys are a perfect audience. Thank you. Do you see any areas that you can compromise with the likely Republican majority in the House to actually get something done for Texas yeah. residents? Thank you. Great question. You know, in San Antonio, we have a huge population of veterans uh, who so often are not served uh, as well as they should be when they come back. That's an issue that we'll be working on. Rural health care issues in Texas and rural public ed issues, something that rural Republicans uh, should be coming together with progressive Democrats around. Uh, and then uh, and then there is also, as far as getting something done for Texas, as I mentioned uh, on with uh, Representative Cory Bush, there's important work that members of Congress need to do that isn't just the legislating work, critical legislating work for us to do, but also, you know, folks have said, what is the first thing you'll do when you're a member of Congress? Well, we've already gotten started on that work uh, just now, right? We have Starbucks workers organizing uh, across five stores between Austin and San Antonio, the first five in Texas. We went and visited every single one of those to go and support those workers so they could get better health care and better wages and better democracy at work, and that helps all of us. Uh, the, we were meeting with workers over here at the Hilton downtown who are talking about forming a union. That's something that just as one member of Congress, uh, we, should, uh, we can go and make a really big difference. Uh, and so I don't have to get um, Mitch McConnell to sign on to that bill, we can actually raise workers' wages uh, and improve people's, uh, improve people's lives uh, just by being able to say, you know, I'm going to stand on the side of workers and stand on the side of labor um, in the face of, of corporate greed. And so it will be, I'm, I'm ready to work with whoever is ready to work on immigration reform or, um, or veterans issues or, or health care issues. And I think that there are Republicans that are willing to step up on those fronts. But then there's also really key work that we should be demanding every member of Congress do to tackle the big crises that we face. The only the other biggest crisis that we haven't talked as much about is the crisis of democracy itself. Um, um, you know, it, we were just joking as I walked in here that in my first election on city council, we had a fraudulent, you know, fraudulent claims and frivolous claims of, of, of ballots not being right, right? And even though we, I won that election with almost twice the votes of my opponent, it, we, we, we talked about that as if it was a funny thing in Austin politics seven or eight years ago. But now, I mean, there's real conversations about how do we make sure that whoever wins the presidential election next becomes president? And that's a real conversation that we're having. Uh, a conversation I was just having with Adam Schiff, who's chair of House Intelligence. That, that is one of the big crises we're facing is how do we make sure that when the American people vote that we continue to respect those elections? And you know, a lot of your questions, a lot of the questions for progressive Democrats is, are you too radical? I mean, how radical is it that we are having to have real conversations about Supreme Court justices and the White House chief of staffs and who is trying to overturn our pres presidential elections? I mean, that's what's radical. That's what's scary. I think what I ran on was what the majority of Texans believe in, $15 an hour minimum wage, health care as a human right, affordable housing, decent union jobs, making sure we have a planet for our kids. These are the reasonable majoritarian positions, and we have to 
uh, turn up the volume on just how radical the right wing has gotten across our country and especially in our state. Well, thanks for that, Greg. And with that, we're out of time. So thanks. Time. To, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for, for spying on me so yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. For a yeah. Good interview. Anytime. Uh, I'll continue to do it when you're in Washington. <laughs> uh, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Greg, uh, for joining us this morning. If you're really interested in Washington and Washington politics, get the latest updates from Washington, D.C. and what they mean for Texans with our weekly newsletter at trib.it slash beltway dash brief. I might have messed that up, so look look that up on check the, the website. Check, check the Texas Tribune.com, right? <laughs> uh, uh, Texas Tribune Festival is happening in downtown Austin again, in person and online this fall. Tickets go on sale in May. Get ready to join us September 22nd through the 24th. We're all super excited to be back in person. You can learn more at festival.texastribune.org. I am sure I got that one right. Uh, if you value our uh, events, donate and join as a member at texastribune.org slash give. Thank you, everyone. I'm sorry, I said again. dot com, but you're at .org. Dot org. Which is you're a great right. thing because you're a nonprofit. You're right, dot org. Thank you for catching that. No, no, I, no, I had gotten it wrong. Yeah, well, thank you, James. I really yeah. appreciate it. I want to thank all of y'all for coming and thank the staff that, that helped us put it together. Um, I just really appreciate all of y'all.